the University of Washington Computer Science and Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Ed Lazowska from Computer Science and Engineering. It's a great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome John Markoff from the New York Times here today. Uh, John uh, grew up in Palo Alto as befits a tech and science columnist. That was some years ago. Uh, he was an undergrad at Whitman College where he majored in sociology. John and I are actually part of a group now that's helping Whitman introduce a computer science undergraduate program, which uh, turns out to be pretty interesting. You have to convince the faculty that it's not vocational, it's part of a liberal arts education. Um, turns out it is. Uh, in 1981, uh, John was part of the original staff of InfoWorld. How many people ever saw an issue of InfoWorld? Unbelievable, yeah, exactly. Uh, in 1984, he was uh, an editor of Byte Magazine. How many of you ever subscribed to Byte? This is pretty good, okay. Uh, in 85, he uh, went to the San Francisco Chronicle uh, where he reported on Silicon Valley. Examiner, excuse me. In 88, uh, went to the New York Times uh, and has gone through business and technology and now uh, science. In 2013, his uh, coverage with others uh, won a Pulitzer Prize. He's written, I believe, five books, is that right? And today he will talk about the fifth, Machines of uh, Love and Grace, which is about the uh, AI revolution and some dichotomies. So John, thanks for being here. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. Ed is actually in incredibly cruel to me. He brings me up here, and I've just spoken to nine of your faculty in the space of what, like four hours? Or my, sort of my mind is kind of blown, and, and each one is absolutely interesting, and um, biological computing is something I'm gonna think about for a number of days, and it may sort of obviate everything I'm gonna tell you, which would be quite ironic. Um, and I also, you know, uh, this is more of a random walk than a distinguished lecture, and I'm, uh, um, uh, as Pedro Dominguez knows, I'm absolutely incapable of keeping to time, so at a certain point, I'll just cut off and we can have a conversation. Um, but this, this book um, essentially uh, sets out two communities within the computer science world um, that I identified, and um, if you want to read something sort of more for formal, both um, Jonathan Gruden from Microsoft and Terry Winograd, who's a computer scientist at, at Stanford, now retired, have written about this dichotomy between augmenting humans and artificial intelligence in, 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 inside the field, and I com commend that to, to you. And uh, let me just start with the title in case it's opaque to anybody. I, I grew up in the 1960s, and um, this was, um, uh, the, uh, the title of a poem, and um, it was written by Richard Brodigan, who was, you know, grew up in Oregon, but was really sort of one of those people who crossed over the cusp between the Bohemian 50s and the hippie 60s. And what was remarkable is he actually spent 10 days as po poet laureate, laureate at Caltech in 1967, and uh, he came away and he wrote this wonderful poem. Um, which I always, I, I didn't discover it until actually the 1980s, although I discovered other of Brodigan's poems more uh, earlier than that. And um, he probably, it's not clear sort of what he saw at Caltech that led to him identifying with computers, which were large mainframes at that point, but it was probably because he spent an afternoon with Richard Feynman. And I don't know what happened then, but Feynman was this very interesting guy, and, and he came away and, and wrote this, this poem. I, I just wanted to say, uh, before I, I start, a couple of things about my own background. I, um, Ed's right, I did grow up in, in, in Palo Alto before it was Silicon Valley. And this is actually, if you look at that redwood tree, that's um, the backyard of my, my parents' house. And if you look at this wonderful adobe hacienda, that's Larry Page's house. That's where the CEO of Google lives today. And um, um, if you, uh, it's actually a wonderful part of Palo Alto that's entirely hidden. This is actually on that adobe wall going around. And when the Padres actually came up El Camino Real, they stopped right there and camped, and they actually made those paving tiles on the roof, roof there. And so it's got this wonderful history. And uh, uh, it was originally uh, a, a home that was built by the curator of the Stanford Art Museum in the 1940s and 1950s, and Larry Page bought it about 15 or 20 years ago and found that because it was historical, he couldn't do what he wanted, and so he bought all the houses around it, um, in, including my parents' house. Um, but, you know, this is my career. That, that was the house where Steve Jobs lived, and that's Larry's house, and that's my parents' house, and that was my paper route. Um, I like to say, that there goes the neighborhood. Um, so, 
So uh, you, you might know sort of my reporting at the New York Times. Um, I, I wrote about um, the program that, that Robert Tappan Morris wrote in the late 1980s called The Internet Worm. Uh, it was a story uh, that I broke, and that was really sort of the first moment that people really came to grips with the power of computer networks, both in good and bad. That was, that was in 1988. I, I wrote about the capture of this computer outlaw by, by, uh, whose name was Kevin Mitnick. Um, I, I wrote about the clipper chip. I broke the story of the clipper chip, and here we are. That was 1992. The debate has come right around again uh, over encryption and whether we should have back doors. It's sort of back to the future. Uh, I wrote the first story about the World Wide Web that was in December of 1993, which seems impossibly long ago. And I broke the story of Google's autonomous uh, car uh, program. For a long time, I was the person who covered uh, computer security uh, for the New York Times. And then after Anonymous and Les Sec, which was a couple of years ago, I decided that I, if I had to write about one more testosterone teenage boy with an attitude, I was going to have an aneurysm, and I needed to do something else. And so I gave up the computer security beat at the New York Times at just the wrong time, because it's been on the front page ever since. And I moved to the science section and began writing about AI and robotics. And um, the, sort of the arc that led to that, that decision actually began in 2004 when Andy Rubin, um, who you might know because he was the inventor of the Android phone project at Xerox, 2004, around DARPA's first autonomous grand challenge, he said, PCs are starting to grow legs and walk around in the environment. And the first time you hear that, you go, well, I don't really know what he's talking about. And over time, I sort of, I, I sort of figured it out. And when I was working on this book, it's sort of this frog in a pot thing. When I was working on this, this book in, in uh, uh, 2012 and 2013, I was, I was, I was working at an office behind Stanford campus, and I was spending time near the golf course. And there was one morning when I parked, because uh, there was a nice cafe there, and a woman pulled her Tesla up next to me. And she got out her golf cart, and uh, she, uh, she walked away, and the golf cart followed her. And the first time you see something like that, you do a, a head fake. And by the time she was at the end of the parking lot, well, you can't really see it at all. It sort of lo looks like the Yeti. But the golf cart was following her. And so um, you know, the next thing you do, you take a picture. And then the next thing you do is caddy um, track, the robotic you, caddy. You Google it, and you find out that anybody can buy these things. And the only question is, can they make it to the 18th hole without the battery running down? But really, we are in this world where these things are starting to emerge all around us. And the only question is, is what's the rate of progress? Um, which is something that I've, I've, I've explored for a long time. So the previous book was about stuff that happened right around Stanford campus uh, between 1965 and 1975. And it was, it was an effort to figure out why did the personal computer happen when it did and where it did. And, um, what I focused on were these two laboratories that were equidistant from Stanford that emerged in the early 1960s at the dawn of interactive computing. Um, and one of them was started by this man by the name of John McCarthy. And uh, McCarthy, uh, by the time he came to Stanford in the early 1960s, he'd already uh, basically coined the term artificial intelligence. He'd invented this programming language. He'd created time sharing. And uh, he sort of created the entire field of artificial intelligence. So he set this lab up. On, on, uh, on, on one side of, uh, of Stanford campus. And at that point, 1962, he wrote a DARPA grant, and he made the assertion that building a working AI, what we now call artificial general intelligence, something that can do all the tasks as human be, could, humans can do, would take a decade. Um, and you know, uh, it's kind of like that, um, this comes up at regular intervals. Uh, you know that if you know Rocky and Bullwinkle, um, but Bullwinkle, that trick never works. This time for sure. And here we are right back you know, with this discussion in front of us um, from people like Elon Musk and, and uh, uh, Stephen Hawking and what have you. Um, but basically, he thought that you could build a machine uh, that would replace the functions of a human being. Just one aside, since this is a, is a computing uh, audience, I wanted to sort of tell you where the term artificial intelligence came from and what underlies your field. And this is from McCarthy's archives. So this is what, what John, John wrote um, in 1996 about coining the term artificial intelligence. He did it 60 years ago. And basically, it comes from um, a petty academic squabble with Norbert Wiener. He thought Wiener was bombastic and a boor, and he didn't want to 
uh, have an argument with him, and he thought that he was misguided about the you know, sort of analog nature of things, and uh, he, he basically coined the term artificial intelligence. And so it's quite ironic, given what's going on in the field of computing today, that AI set out in this direction as a, as a sort of opposition to, to Norbert Wiener um, because of a faculty disagreement. But, you know, they were both on the faculty at, at MIT. Um, so here we are, back to the future. Um, on the other side of campus, there was this man, you probably know, Doug Eng Douglas Engelbart, who invented the mouse, and um, many of the other technologies that would then be taken to Xerox Park and then be borrowed by Bill, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and become what we use as the modern computing and the internet now. And Engelbart had set out after World War II to really build a set of uh, technologies that would augment human intelligence. He took that on as his lifetime passion and uh, had a, a, a real impact on the world. And so I saw that there were, it, it, was how, it was quite striking that, that there were these two laboratories and out of them came these two communities. I tend to see things as a social scientist. And these two communities have largely not spoken to each other. And to my, my goal was to sort of square the circle because of course when you augment human intelligence, it, it not only creates a dichotomy between these two fields, but it creates a paradox. Because of course if you're successful in augmenting human intelligence, you need fewer humans. And uh, that was what I began thinking about in 2010, 2011. Just one more, one more quick aside. Um, so um, this is Shockley, who of course is, um, is uh, sort of associated with the roots of, of Silicon Valley. And before I stumbled across this particular research while I was doing this book, I had sort of flippantly said, you know, why did Silicon Valley happen where it happened? Well, it happened because Shockley's mother lived in Palo Alto and she was ailing and he moved back from Bell Labs where he'd invented the transistor and gotten the Nobel Prize in the early 1950s to set up Shockley Semiconductor. So it all made sense. And then uh, I ran across the wor this work of this uh, historian who, who was working on a, a biography of Gordon Moore, David Brock, and he stumbled across this memo um, in, the, um, in, this, uh, uh, in the Stanford archives where uh, he shows that Shockley actually, um, along with many people in American society at that point, was, was really fascinated with automation. And he'd set out to, um, to uh, basically, he wrote a three-page memo inside Bell, Bell Labs in 1952 calling on Bell Labs to build an automatic trainable robot. And if you look at this, if you read this document, basically it's Baxter. It's what Rod Brooks would do 30 or 40 years later um, basically a very simple machine that had eyes, hands, and could do function, functional things. Um, what was sort of significant is he went to Beckman, who was the person who funded Shockley Semiconductor, not to build the transistor, but to build the machine vision eye for his robot. And so the roots of Silicon Valley are entirely in robotics, and it's, it's been completely lost. Um, so where are we today? Um, you know, we, we're in the midst of this debate about the rate of progress and the acceleration of computing. And I, I just want to sort of frame things, because um, if you listen to this debate that's sort of accelerated over the last two years about the possibility of intelligent machines and the things that people like Elon Musk and Hawking and Stuart Russell and Bill Gates are saying, they assume this notion of something called the singularity, which of course is a science fiction term which was coined by Werner Vinge some years ago, but it, it's basically uh, a, a sort of a statement about where Moore's law is going. It, it basically, we'll get this increase in the performance of computing until such time, probably 10 to 15 years hence, where we'll have this explosion of computing, the machines will learn faster, they'll surpass, surpass human intelligence, and God knows what'll happen. Except, I, I just want to give you sort of five points on where we are today from the point of view of someone who's in Silicon Valley. Um, 2006, something called Denard scaling, which is an art of, sort of an analog to, to, uh, to Moore's law. Basically, the, the rate of increase of clock speeds stopped. Basically, computer clock speeds have not going, gone up since then. Um, really remarkable thing happened two or three months ago. For about two decades, Intel was on this pace, which they called TikTok. They come up with a new design and they shrink it. They come up with a new design and they shrink it, and it was just like a metronome. And it really drove the valley. And as this curve sort of accelerated, you get entire new industries at regular intervals for free. And then just two or three months ago, TikTok stopped. It was TikTok talk, and so we 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 missed at 10 nanometers, and that, that was a, a big deal. 
Um, the other th uh, thing that's true right now is there's this, uh, the, they call it in the industry dark silicon. Um, basically, you have these wonderful microprocessors, but you can't use all the transistors all the time or else they melt. And so your smartphone has all of these algorithms to sort of turn things on and turn things off. And so, of course, you lose the economic value of the transistors if you can't use them all at the same time. Really interesting thing that I haven't been able to get to the bottom of, one of the amazing things about Moore's Law is the cost of transistors falls. And so you, that means that you get to, you get to sort of a, a better design for free by just sort of going down that process at regular intervals, except that about 2012, 2014, for the entire industry, except apparently Intel, um, the cost of transistors stopped falling. And we're, we're plateaued there. I, I don't understand how Intel can sort of escape gravity, but, but, but they claim they are, they are. But for the rest of the industry, it's not happening. And then finally, um, exascale computing, you know, the value of parallelism, we were supposed to reach in 2018. And um, we're going to be lucky if we see it by 2023, uh, if then. Um, and so, uh, you know, parallelism is not sort of picking up the slack and dividing all the, providing all the benefits. So I had this wonderful moment uh, sort of when the uh, Stanford Affiliates Program this spring was grappling with this reality that things are slowing down. And um, at the end of the event, I ran into this Harvard computer architect by the name of David Brooks, who had been listening to the same things that I had, and he was giddy. Um, because he, what he said to me, now it's our turn. Um, we may not get this free ride. Progress will be episodic, but creativity will make a difference. And so it's a really, it's, it's, we're at that interesting point. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, as a rule, I try not to s speculate about anything that is longer away than a half decade. And uh, my mantra is, is what Paul Sappho, who's a longtime Silicon Valley pundit, says, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. Um, and um, so um, um, and one of the things that I've come to say from being around Silicon Valley for a long time is the visionaries are always wrong. And I can't tell you how, how, uh, how useful a, a sort of a, a, an idea that is because that's the best thing about being a reporter is you just have to report what, what, what they say. So, so my, my book is a set of uh, interwoven portraits. I, I tried to look at the people who sort of moved from AI to IA in their careers and try to understand why they did that. And, um, you know, starting with a machine, this was the very first AI platform. It was, it was uh, created by a man by the name of Charlie Rosen, who was a really fascinating character in the 1960s in Silicon Valley. And he did it because he had gotten very interested in artificial intelligence and he wanted a platform. And he was kind of a rainmaker at SRI then. He was the kind of guy who would go back to Washington and get money from the Pentagon. And he went back and he sold Ruth da Davis, who was a Pentagon bureaucrat, on the idea of building a sentry for a military base. Um, and, and, the, and they asked him, of course, you know, well, can it carry a gun? And his response was, sure, two or three. How many do you need? Well, uh, you, you know, um, Shaky was an incredibly cel well celebrated failure because uh, it, it never actually carried a gun. And uh, Life magazine called it uh, the world's first electronic person. And um, that turned out to be very problematic. Uh, that Life article quoted Marvin Minsky that within three to five years, computers would be writing Shakespeare, they'd be changing the oil in cars, and th those things never happened. Um, but um, Shaky was very important. A lot of the technologies that we have today in our smartphones actually came out of that platform. The navigational um, tools, algorithms that are in your smartphone started there. Siri started there, the first research on, on speech recognition. Um, one of the young men who worked on, on Shaky was, was a young computer hacker by the name of Bill Duvall who'd taken all the computer classes you could take at Berkeley in the mid-1960s. They didn't have a CS department. He dropped out. He came down to work on the Shaky project. And after a while, he was, he was unhappy because Shaky was kind of run like a military top-down project. And he looked across the hallway, and there was Doug Engelbart's group, which was came across kind of as a bunch of hippies, and it looked like they were having a lot more fun than the shaky guys were, and he jumped, he jumped over. He was the first one to cross over from AI to IA. On October 29th, 1969, um, he, wrote, he wrote the code for node one of the 
ARPANET, the forerunner to the internet. And he was there at that moment, the Watson come here quick moment of the ARPANET. That first, it wasn't a message, it was a remote login. Log um, and you, you know, it was actually a loop around is what happened. Uh, he, he was talking to UCLA, but he was actually trying to log into a machine in, in, uh, in Menlo Park because the ARPANET was built. And if you go back to RFC number two, you'll see that the first killer app um, uh, for the ARPANET, for what would become the internet, was the online system. It was basically the forerunner to Microsoft Office. And, um, and of course, the rich irony is he typed L-O-G, it was 10 o'clock at night, and because of a buffer overflow, the machine crashed on G. And I just so find that so richly ironic because here we're still plagued with buffer overflow problems and architectural issues, uh, you know, how many years later. Um, but but um, Bill would go on to, to be one of the people on the original Mac team. He wrote both the first um, C compiler and the first assembler for the Mac. So he ended up on the AI side of the coin. The other person I wanted to point to in this context is Terry Winograd, who began as sort of an AI win wonderkin at MIT in the 60s. Uh, Terry wrote Shridloo, an early natural language processing program, which was kind of a virtual version of Shaky. You could command it to do things in this virtual world, and it would understand you. And then he came out to Stanford and to Xerox Park, and he worked for a decade on AI problems. And then sort of famously, in the early 1980s, walked away from the field. He gave up. Um, he had had a, a series of conversations with a group of philosophers like Hub Hubert Dreyfus and John Searle at Berkeley, and he decided that AI was an impossibility, and he went over to the HCI side of the coin. And I, 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 I think that this is... So to, to make my point that these things, kind of these personal decisions sort of have an impact on the world, um, Terry Winograd was Larry Page's uh, thesis advisor, and he was the one who sort of was very influential in the thesis topic that Larry chose, which was PageRank, which became Google Search, which arguably is the most powerful augmentation tool ever in, in, invented. So values, my, my point is values have an impact. On the other side of the coin, Andy Rubin um, began as a robotics hobbyist, um, was an Apple manufacturing engineer, um, was one of the people at General Magic, uh, uh, went on to Web TV, created Danger, which was one of the first successful smartphones, which it actually became a, a sort of a, both Larry Page and Sergey Brin fell in love with Dangers, and they both had them on their belt at, uh, at a certain point. And then, of course, they hired Andy. Um, the irony was that Android, I don't know if you know this bit of history, Android was very defensive. Uh, uh, Google was very paranoid about Microsoft and Microsoft moving in a mobile direction. Android was done as an open source uh, uh, project as a self-defense move against being locked out of search in a mobile world. It just got a little out of hand. Um, so. Um, Andy then, after Android, built this Google Robotics team, and not a lot's known about that. He, after he, you know, he hired 13, he, he, he bought 13 companies for Google, some of the best robotics talent in the world, Shaft in Japan, Boston Dynamics on the East Coast. He lasted four months and he left um, because he tends to start things well, he doesn't run things well. But he's now at a, uh, essentially an incubator called Play, Play, Playground Global, which is, like one half of Fry's. If you know what Fry's is like in Palo Alto, it's this giant big box store, and he's taken over half of it full of uh, basically machine learning and artificial intelligence stuff. Um, so um, another person I'd just like to mention in terms of sort of charting this, this trajectory from AI to IA is Tom Gruber, who very much grew up in the same tradition as Terry Winograd, formerly educated as an AI uh, researcher showed up to work as a postdoc with Feigenbaum, um, but then really sort of moved over to the IA side in a couple of sort of career steps. He tried to build a company to implement some of Engelbart's idea, which was doing very well until the dot-com collapsed. And um, then he ended up at SRI just as Siri, which of course had started as you know the, the speech research done at SRI, and got involved in that that team. And you know. I, what was very striking, I mean, so I, I keep looking for sort of the, the, the sociological threads here, um, because all of, this, all of this technological stuff, I would argue, happens in a context, a, a political and social and economic context. And the wonderful thing about Siri, that I don't think is widely known, is two of the architects, 
Adam Chire and, and uh, Tom Gruber were deeply influenced by seeing Apple's promotional vision, uh, video called Knowledge Navigator. And they said, we want to build that. Um, and I thought, that's kind of interesting. And so, you know, I knew something of the history of Knowledge Navigator. I knew that basically after Steve Jobs left Apple, um, John Scully needed some ideas because he just sold Pepsi. He wasn't really a computer guy. And so he went to Kay and said, you know, I need a modern Dynabook which Kay thought was kind of humorous because he didn't think the Dynabook existed then in 1987, but he got some ideas together that actually showed up as this remarkable video that you may have seen in which a human, a, a, an, a, a, an avatar on a display um, sort of helps an absent-minded professor with all the kind of day-to-day -day things that they need. And it was very influential in Silicon Valley. And so I went to Kay and I said, so where did you get these ideas for Knowledge Navigator? And he said, oh, it's, it was simple. I was simply channeling Nicholas Negroponte. So Negroponte, of course, is the architect who built the Media Lab during, um, during the, the 1970s and 1980s. And they had done a lot of research on conversational systems. They'd prototyped all of this stuff. So I went to Negroponte, and I said, where did you get these ideas? And he, he said, oh, simple. I got them from Gordon Pask. And I said, who? And Gordon Pask was a British cyberneticist who was visiting regularly during the early 1980s and later in um, in, uh, uh, in Boston, he would come and he would stay at Marvin Minsky's house. And um, he was the one, I mean, he, had, he basically had this model of, of human intelligence as growing out of the con uh, a conversation between two act actors. And so you can take this all the way back to Wiener, which I always thought um, was just remarkable. So a, a couple of a, a quick uh, sort of stories about my path to this book, which really started with the first DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2004, and I just became fascinated with uh, these machines. Um, you know, of course, the DARPA Robotics Challenge originally happened because Congress had mandated that one third of the US military land ve vehicle fleet be autonomous by 2015. Um, of course, we haven't gotten there, but more than half of all of our military air vehicles are, in fact, not piloted. So in some sense, we've made that. But uh, Tether, uh, who was a sort of a creature of the military industrial contracts, got very creative and he decided to open this up to anybody. And this, of course, is the red team um, uh, uh, robot uh, in the first one, uh, 2004. It looked like they, they were, they were going to win hands down. Red Whitaker, a well known field roboticist, came with a team of photo analysts, and everything looked really great. I mean, it's so impressive. There were a bunch of hobbyists, and then there was this, you know, this um, amazing system. Um, but you could tell right from the beginning that they were having trouble. I mean, they were following a, a, a trail of GPS dots, but they were having trouble staying on the road. That's both sides of the same road. And they made it for seven and a half miles, and they did better than everybody else. My particular favorite was a young man from Berkeley whose name was Anthony Lewandowski, who b built this gyroscopically stable, uh, stabilized motorcycle. The, the great story is he was so nervous at the starting line that he forgot to switch the gyroscope on. And so and, uh, so at the end of that uh, first year, I, I flew over the, the field of the contest, and there were these little dots of dead robots everywhere. And it looked like Tether had just totally screwed up. I mean, it looked like a disaster. Um, a year and a half later, everything changed. This, of, of course, is, is Stanley, um, the Stanford entry that was uh, led by a, a, a roboticist, uh, um, uh, Sebastian Thrun. Um, you know, it really changed the popular perception, and a whole set of things happened out of that. But in fact, there were problems all along. One of the absolute best things going to happen to you as a reporter is to be in a robot accident that you can walk away from, because you get this great, great story. But it really sort of gave me an insight to the way that Sebastian worked and he thought, because we, we basically came over a swale at about 25 miles an hour in the Arizona desert, and the LIDAR saw a branch that was above the road, and Sebastian had this big red e-stop button that was supposed to stop it, but we were off the road before he could touch it. And luckily, this was this tree that we ran into instead of the two boulder piles on either side. He backed it out. He straightened out the lighter. And you know, there were a couple more problems during the day. But it was, it was, um, you know, it was, it was this moment um, where robots really went from being, from being seen as toys to being seen as things that could change the world. It was this, this sort of defining moment. And it was actually, this was, uh, this was in 2005. It was actually super exciting, because the red team, Red Whitaker's second team, was way ahead and looked like they were going to win handily. And then they had this mechanical failure. And Sebastian's team swept by, and they won the $2 million 
dollar of the prize. And of course, the chain of events was Sebastian then went to Google to set up Google X and start the self-driving car project. And um, that was one of my favorite scoops. I was the one who reported on the Google car uh, in 2010. And it's kind of a funny story because, you know, they were driving these things in plain view for a half a year before, before I reported it. So why weren't, you know, why didn't people figure this out? So they were driving at night. Um, and they also had this fleet of Google um, uh, Street View cars. And so people couldn't tell the difference between a LiDAR and the camera, and so they largely escaped detection. But I'd heard kind of rumors, and Sebastian had said a couple of things, and it was starting to filter out. And then uh, at a certain point, um, uh, I was actually at a Christmas party at my cousin's house, and my cousin's son said to me, you know, I've got this friend who went to school with me in Menlo Atherton, and Google's paying him $15 an hour to sit in a car, but he's not driving. And, and so I, I simply drove over to Google's campus, and these things were parked there, and I knew what a LiDAR was, and so they sort of, they, they, it was nice, because I'd had a lot of, I'd been the beat reporter on Google, and we'd had a lot of trouble over the years because they were very secretive, but they actually gave me this story. And, um, and of course, as it came out, it had this huge impact on the world's automotive industry. Basically, all of the automotive automobile manufacturers that weren't in Silicon Valley came to Silicon Valley because they did not want to be like the hardware manufacturers who were commoditized by Microsoft. They knew, they knew what this movie looked like, and they didn't want that to happen again. So um, here we are. I don't know if you saw the news yesterday, but um, the California DMV said that a self-driving car has a driver in it and has a steering wheel and a brake and a, a, an accelerator, which was a huge setback for Google, which we can talk about. So, uh, you know, this was another uh, sort of uh, a significant point. This is a video that uh, uh, Boston Dynamics put out sometime before they built the first robots for the DARPA Rescue Challenge, which was the next contest that, that happened. And um, I'm showing it because it had this huge impact on the world, but what you have to know about this is it's highly scripted and it's not showing machine autonomy. This was teleoperation. Very impressive teleoperation, but um, there was, you know, there's, there's really impressive low level autonomy, but you know, there's a man behind the, 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 the curtain. And th that's certainly true here. This was at the first um, DARPA Robotics Challenge. This was the highlight of the show. This is another Boston Dynamics robot that of course was, um, was bought by, by Google and is now part of the, the, the companies that work for Google. Um, and they've continued to uh, uh, evolve these things. Um, you know, when, when Andy uh, acquired those companies, I mean, Google has never said publicly what they want to do. And, and, and actually, you know, it's not clear what they're going to do because they have not hired a replacement for Andy Rubin since he left running this group. Um, but what Andy told the companies that he was hiring is his vision was a 15-year journey to um, a world in which the Google car would drive up to your uh, door and the Google robot would hop off the back and put the package on your, on your, uh, uh, put the package on your, on your, on your step, which to me is, a, uh, until recently I thought was much more plausible than the Amazon drone flying in and dropping it off, but I guess that's a question of um, where we'll end up. But, um, so, you know, that's our vision of these machines. Once again, remember there's a man with a backpack here. This is not autonomous. Uh, it's not fully autonomous, although it's very impressive. Um, but this is ground truth. Uh, this is where we are today. Um, this was the second uh, DARPA Grand Challenge this, this spring, which was great fun. Um, 24 contestants, um, 18 months, millions of dollars each, um, eight simple tasks. Um, you know, you had to drive a vehicle, you had to walk, you had to open a door, um, you had to uh, throw a switch or, um, or uh, climb over uneven ground. And three of, the, three of the contestants actually did it. They took about 50 minutes instead of the six or seven that you or I would need. Um, but, you know, at the end um, uh, of this, uh, you know, Gil Pratt was the DARPA ro ro robotics a project manager who organized this, and his son, Joel Pratt, said, you know, his, the takeaway lesson from this is, um, if you're worried about the Terminator, just keep your door closed. So, so the, once again, it's a question of rate of progress, because I've seen the stuff that's going on now in the laboratories, but it was not, uh, it, it was not in, in those robots at that time. Um, and, you know, 
so they had three autonomous vehicle grand challenges. They only had two of these. Uh, you know, this was supposed to be building systems that could work in these areas where humans can't work. And I was talking to the students who were involved in these teams, and they really should have had a third one. And one of the students proposed this idea of a third DARPA rescue challenge, and that would be to send a robot into an urban area full of people, and the robot would have to get from one place to, the next, to another place by asking people for directions and then going there. And that would have been really a fun contest, but they, they haven't done that. Um, so um, the two contests sort of help frame this new debate that we're amidst of in, the, in terms of automation. I wanted to talk a little bit about this automation debate because, you know, since Wiener, since the 1950s, we at regular intervals as a society have really come to worry about automa uh, automation and its impact on society and the workforce. And I, I have to confess, I started on one side with my hair on fire, worried that this would be uh, uh, a, a really dramatic thing, and I've come entirely to the other side, and I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, so in the past five years, the debate has really re-emerged, um, and um, that's Walter Ruther, but it's really sort of at, at its heart, you know, there was this wonderful moment at, at Ford in the 1950s where one of the companies was showing Ruther around Ford's plant, and, and uh, he was showing him in a new automatically controlled machine, and he said, you know, he was teasing him, he said, Walter, how are you going to collect union dues from these guys? And Ruther's response was, well, how are you going to get them to buy Ford's? And we're still exactly at, at, at that point. And you know, this debate that's emerged in the last five years, from a reporter's point of view, is just the best thing uh, that you can have happen. Because you have everything from on one side of the debate, you have the International Federation of Robotics, who's arguing that this will be the job renaissance of all times, that basically these robots lead to new jobs. On the other side of the debate, you have people like um, uh, Moshi Vardy at Rice University, a computer scientist who argue no jobs at all left by 2045. And you know the truth obviously will be somewhere in between. I got in the middle of it in 2010 when I began to notice that $35 an hour paralegals and $400 an hour attorneys were being displaced by programs that could read legal documents and do a demonstrably better job than humans. And that seemed to be quite a dramatic shift from an era where machines had replaced blue collar labor to uh, uh, machines that replaced, uh, replaced in, you know, high end white collar workers. And I wanted to look at this in the case of China in 2012, and I spent like a, a half a year trying to get to China as a reporter. And because my newspaper has a small quarrel with the Chinese government, I couldn't get there. And at a certain point, I gave up. And um, I, I, I went uh, to the Netherlands, where I saw this production line, which makes uh, basically the high end of Philips uh, electric razors. Um, it's an entirely lights out factory. Um, the, you, the, the, the razor is interesting to me um, because it's arguably, from a mechanical assembly point of view, it's more difficult than putting together a smartphone. There are more components and stuff. And those are adept robot arms. There are 128 of them. They operate at two second intervals. Um, the only place there are humans on the line are eight women in white coats at the end, and their job is to do QA by listening to the, the razors. You can tell how well the razor's been built by, by just putting it up to your ear. And they can produce 15 million razors a year, and the, sort of the, the lesson is um, what's different between razors and cell phones Razors, they don't change the model for a decade. Cell phones, they change the model every nine to 10 months, and so you can't basically reprogram these things quickly enough, and that's, that's changing. Um, so um, uh, this is uh, another example of sort of the pace of, of industrial automation. Um, this is a, a, another one of the companies that was acquired by uh, Andy Rubin, um, a, a group in Palo Alto that was going to load and unload uh, uh, trucks. And um, you know the, the the machines worked. Uh, the humans work every six seconds. The packages weigh up to 70 pounds. Um, you know they get tired. Their backs get hurt. Um, at the point that they were acquired by Google, uh, Industrial Perception would get a FedEx contract to do this um, if they could do a box every four seconds. And they were at that level uh, at that point. Um, they thought they could go to two seconds. And so that job of a lumper, which is kind of a terrible job, um, it, it looks like it's sort of 
it, it's destined uh, for, for replacement. And what actually, you know, this was all made possible by the Xbox. That's one thing to point out. It is the uh, the you know falling costs when you get these order of magnitude changes. You get these new functions and. Um, you know, Prime Sense and Structured Light made something that had cost tens of thousands of dollars fall to $100, and, and so this was possible. Um, so, um, just a cautionary tale uh, about this question of jobs. This was a book written by an economist, Jerry Rifkin, in 1995, where he was arguing for the end of work. And just to put it in context, um, you know, in the succeeding decade, um, you know, the American workforce actually grew by 19% while the population only grew by 11%. So, you know, be very, be very careful about what you predict and, and timing is everything. Um, a couple of examples on, on this about sort of wh why I've come over. There have been a, a whole host of books about uh, the, sort of the, the crisis that we're facing. And um, a lot of them have mentioned this, this sort of trade-off between 13 programmers at Instagram and 140,000 workers in a chemical manufacturing company like Kodak. Um, 13 workers to place 140,000, except that's not what happened at all. Um, and it just sort of it muddies the, the, the picture. And it's full of nuances. Um, first of all, Kodak wasn't killed by Instagram. Kodak put a gun to its head strategically and pulled the trigger repeatedly until it went bankrupt. Um, and, uh, you know, sad to say, but the proof is that Fuji, who was Kodak's prime competitor, made it across the chasm just fine. And then the other thing you have to remember is Instagram couldn't emerge until the mature commercial internet existed, which was probably responsible for between 2.5 and 4 million, many of them good jobs. So just to say it, it's, it, it's much more complex. On the other side of the equation, President Obama got in a little trouble in 2011 when he said that uh, bank tellers were being displaced by, by computers. And in fact, I mean, he, he just got a little muddled. The number of bank tellers in the face of tremendous changes in the banking industry has maintained, maintained itself as constant. And what's happened is falling costs of computing and telecommunication has meant that there's a branch on every bank, uh, a branch on every street corner. There are many, as many banks as there are Starbucks. And the banks like to have human-facing um, uh, employees, and so bank tellers have stayed constant. What he should have said is those people who handled checks in the, bank of, uh, the back of banks, they're gone. They've, they've been hit by a neutron bomb. And so there have been dramatic changes. And um, I, just one thing to, to, to say to this is that do a thought experiment about this problem. It's sort of not about the technology. Think about a job that could be easily automated, a barista. And then think about Starbucks without baristas. And you realize that it's a more complex problem than it might look at first. And this is where, where, where I came down. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was talking to this economist, Danny Kahneman, um, about the situation in China and trying to make the argument that as automation came to China, it would lead to disruption. And he said, you don't get it. If we're lucky in China, the robots will come just in time. And I said, excuse me? That didn't make any sense to me. And he walked me through what's going on in China, Chinese society. China is an aging society. It's aging much more quickly, largely because of the one-child policy, than American society. Um, and in fact, I think in a, within a decade, there will be literally a third less 19-year-olds in China. They will, one, not have enough workers, and two, they will have a dramatically aging population. So they'll have this problem of elder care which is an interesting uh, question in its own right. And so, you know, in a real sense, um, since, uh, you know, my metric when I go around and talk to AI researchers about where we stand, my metric is, when will there be a machine that can give an aging human a shower? I think that's a good benchmark, and we're a long, long way away from that right, right now. Um, you know, um, right now, for the first time in history, there are more uh, humans in the world who are over 65 than are under five. And it's true everywhere but Africa. We're aging, probably less so than the rest of the world, but Europe and Asia are aging dramatically. And the world is going to look very different uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. 2050, there will be double the number of 80-year-olds in the world. The end of the century, there will be 70 time, seven times as many 80-year-olds in the world. And I think that's, that's what we, we need to look to. Just one more point on the job question, because it's really evolved. And we've gone from this kind of panic 
to these new studies that have come out just recently that have really reframed the issue in an important way. There was a McKinsey study uh, about two weeks ago that pointed out that what's going on right now is not job automation, but task automation. And in fact, the impact, um, if you look at the economy broadly, is about 5% of all jobs in the American economy are at risk over the next five years. And if that's true, it's a very different situation. And, and even more so, there was a really interesting study uh, a week before last from a, a guy at, at Boston University where he, he did the same study that the Oxford guys did that got everybody alarmed uh, about two years ago about the job categories that were subject to automation. He redid it, and his view is that for 370 job cat categories in the United States, there's a direct correlation between the level of computerization and the rate of job growth. And so if, th if that's true, then it's a very different situation. The, the place where we have to worry is this question of polarization, where it's pretty clear that the middle has declined since at least 2008 in the recession, where the companies like Oracle and SAP and IBM have basically done this business process reengineering thing and taken out routinized white collar jobs. And that's, a, that's an interesting problem. Um, one of the areas that, um, that I think a lot about uh, are, are these, this is Watson, and one of the wonderful things about Watson that's not known, you know, they got, IBM got tremendous publicity for Watson beating uh, a human Jeopardy player, Ken Jenkins, and I forget who the other guy was, Ken Jennings and his partner in 2011. It turns out that at that level of Jeopardy, pretty much everybody knows the answer to the question, and what Watson was really good at, Watson actually had to push a button and there's this little window that you have that you have to push in in. You can push in too early, you can push in too late. And Watson was using a statistical model to push in and it could beat the humans every time. And that was why Watson really, really won. But, you know, here now we are, four years later, IBM is betting its company on the Watson technology, which it calls cognitive computing. And I think it's going to be a fascinating sort of AI versus IA question because IBM has pitched Watson as being a medical advisor as being something that a doctor can rely on, as being an augmentation tool. And you know, I think that it could change the face of medicine. But how's Watson going to be deployed? And you know, I don't think we have a clear view yet. Will it be used as a doctor's advisor? Or will it be used as a physician, ph physician assistant's advisor? In which case, it could change the structure of, of medicine. It could lower the cost of giving medical care. But it might also get rid of a lot, lot of doctors. Um, so. Um, uh, this is, uh, this was a sort of, so I, a lot of, th one of the things I thought a lot about is our relation to these machines, because as a, as a species, you know, we seem to be willing to anthropomorphize anything. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk to our cars, we'll talk to our computers. Um, this was a company that was building FAQ bots in Australia a number of years ago. One of the experiments they did, so they, that's that little text box, you can type to it. They put it up on a major national Australian bank, and they found that more than 90, and it was, it was software that was answering questions in a bunch of domain areas in the financial area, more than 90% of the people who were interacting with their FAQ bot thought that there was a human on the other side. They were passing the Turing test for all pra pra practical purposes, which I refer to as a test of human gullibility. Um, and, and so uh, the woman who started um, uh, this company, uh, Liesl Kapper, thought she, she, would, she would get some branding. And what she did was um, she created My Perfect Girlfriend and My Perfect Boyfriend to sort of encourage people to have conversations with these machines. And then she was getting so much traffic to My Perfect Girlfriend that she put up a paywall. And she discovered that 4% of the traffic were willing to pay for the privilege of interacting with my perfect girlfriend. And then she began to read the transcripts, and she discovered she'd become a digital madam. And it freaked her out so much that she turned it off. And, uh, but um, there are deep questions here. This is a remarkable story. Uh, Toyota, um, a, a couple of years ago, began putting humans back into their manufacturing line, which I thought was a really interesting uh, uh, response to this issue that sort of we, we worry about in terms of how smart will these machines be, they have a really high quality production system which doesn't improve itself. And so by putting the humans back in, they were able to figure out ways to improve the production facility, which I think sort of gets at um, the, 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 the question in a, a really good and fundamental way. So here we are. Um, I've been joking that it, uh, almost a week doesn't go by where I don't have to write a story about a new billion dollar AI research lab. And Toyota um, came to Stanford, sadly not the University of Washington, 
um, a couple of months ago, and they basically created a $1 billion research effort. But it wasn't focused on self-driving cars. It was focused on building cars that won't crash. And uh, Rod Brooks, who's a well-known roboticist, has referred to these things as the first elder care robots. And actually, that's, that's probably true, because one of the, the, you know, the real challenges of aging is at a certain point, you can't drive anymore. And so if we can build cars that'll make us independent longer, I think it, it's, it's, really, it's a really a huge deal. Um, I'm talking way too long, so let me skip to, to, to the very end. So uh, you know, as we build these systems, the, the other IA question is, what's our relationship going to be to these machines that we create? Are they going to be our slaves or our masters or our partners? And uh, my, my point is this, is, this is really an IA question. It's a question the designers have control over, and it depends on their values. Um, uh, you know, Microsoft is running this fascinating experiment in China now called Zhao Ice. They've created a FAQ bot, a chat bot, and uh, it, it's different than Siri and Cortana in that it's meant to be a conversationalist. It's meant to engage you in long conversations. And, um, you know, 20 million Chinese are interacting with, uh, with uh, 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 Zhao Ice every day. 10 million of them are intense users, meaning they will have up to 60 interactions with Zhao Ice a day. Um, 25% have typed I love you to Zhao Ice. 50% have typed thank you. Um, and so this was even freaking out the people in Redmond who were involved in the design. And I was talking to an IBM researcher who was Chinese about this, and she said, you don't get it. Um, when we come to your country in the United States, um, we feel like it's, it, it's quiet, it's socially quiet. We're much more a society where we're in contact with each other all the time. And her view was that Zhao Ice was simply giving people private space. Uh, this is a way to be alone with their, their, with their thoughts. In, in, in China, they call it toilet time. The kids go into the bathroom late at night to have a conversation with Zhao Ice. But I think you know, conversational agents are upon us, and we're going to have to think a lot about the relationship we have with these machines. Just um, two other uh, points, because you know, this was totally science fiction. Uh, the, the notion of cyborg was a term that was coined in the 1960s by NASA researchers to sort of point to the notion of evolving humans into space. And now, all of a sudden, we have things like the Obama Brain Initiative, where you know, it's not only intended, the goal of that program is not only to read from a, a million neurons simultaneously, but to write to a million neurons si simultaneously. So when I think cyborg, I'm, you know, I'm enough of a science fiction devo devotee that I'm aware of the Borg. You know, resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. And I think we have to think very carefully as we attach these systems to us or as they augment us. Um, you know, the most popular trend in robotics right now is cloud robotics. And the wonderful thing about machine learning is when one machine learns something, they all know it instantly, which is not the way humans, humans learn. And I think we're on the cusp of actually having to deal with this in a, in a, in a, in a, a meaningful way, which leads me back to Norbert Wiener, who in 1950 sort of laid this out, and here we are. We can be humble and live a good life with the aid of the machines, or we can be arrogant and die. And I think, you know, 70 years later, it's still worth thinking about. Thank you very much. On the subject of job displacement, <clears throat> you've taught me not to lose sleep over all the jobs going away. But <clears throat> assuming that some number will, how concerned are you that this will take us to a path of class warfare when the capitalists that own the machines get all the benefit from that, and those who lose their jobs are either too old or unskilled to take the new jobs, and so they have no resources? Yeah. I, I've been having a running debate with, uh, with an AI researcher who's written a very interesting book called Humans Need Not Apply, Jerry Kaplan. And Kaplan basically argues your point. He argues that, um, you know, um, uh, you know, capital is, is essentially frozen technology, and it, he argues that it's forcing this increasing inequality. And I just don't think the evidence is in yet um, whether tax policy or technology is more, uh, uh, you, you know, more at, uh, at the root of this growing inequality. Clearly, there is growing inequality, and it's correlated with these changes in the workforce, but I'm not sure that we can blame technology for it. Uh, so, um, what if we could change our tax policy and it would protect us against that in a more, in a different political climate that might be possible. Thanks for being here, John. Thank you. Thank you.